Hi, today I want to talk about Vikings in the media because there's a lot of them these days. And frankly, I'd like to talk about what they do right, what they get wrong, and some changes that would make the narrative more interesting. So with that in mind, we should start with this basic question. What even are Vikings? For Valhalla! Really, dude? What? What do you mean? Okay, the furs, that LARPer shield, you look like a Conan the Barbarian extra. I love Viking history, but I really don't like a lot of the media about them. So TV shows like The Last Kingdom or Vikings, the trailer for the upcoming Assassin's Creed video game, um, these have left me more disappointed than excited. To talk about what can be done right and what is done right, as well as the problems I keep seeing in the media, we should understand what Vikings are and what they are not. Vikings are not fur or leather clad barbarians. The word Viking is not a word for every single person from Scandinavia in the early Middle Ages. And Vikings are not some purebred Aryan master race that white supremacists want to cling to. In fact, that's in many ways the opposite of a lot of what their value set got into, but we'll discuss that in a second. So if that's what they aren't, what are they? So the word Viking is actually a job. It's something that someone did. Someone went a Viking, or they were a Viking, and that meant that they would go on their ship. They were from one of these Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, or a couple of other places. And uh, when they got in their ship, they went raiding, trading, or exploring. Now, the big one we always focus on is raiding, and I'm going to get into a lot of that. But Viking raiders, they would, you know, sail up river or tack along the beaches, and um, they would, you know, get off their ships, they'd come out of nowhere, just blitzkrieg, run in, kill a bunch of people, take whatever was valuable, get back in their ship, and sail away. And that's why they were so feared, it was these shock tactics. Now, it was actually a fairly common practice at the time, but people living along the coast were, or even more, further inland along a river, were not used to these sort of quick tactics that the Vikings would use. It was terrifying. You know, your, your average medieval peasant, suddenly these guys come in and next thing you know, your home is on fire, people are screaming, and if you survive the experience, you're left completely destitute. Um, but just as true was the fact that Vikings were explorers. They discovered Greenland, Iceland, Canada. They got as far as Baghdad, founded modern Russia. And one account of dubious quality suggested at least one Viking crew got to India. Um, not holding that one too credible. But beyond that, what we've got is um, Vikings also, they were traders, you know? The same goods that they may have stolen from one coastline, they'd sell on the other. Now imagine yourself, you're the average medieval peasant, and suddenly you're living inland along a river, mist kind of clinging, and this dragon-proud ship comes just bellying in out of the mist. People unload storm all the houses, start burning, hacking down anyone who stands in their way, and take everything of value. It was terrifying. But in the Viking Age, that was just one of many things that was going on. Most historians look at the Viking Age as beginning in the year 793, when Viking ships attacked the island of Lindisfarne off the coast of northern England. There was a very important monastery there that was uh, sacked, and then ending in the year 1066, five days before the Battle of Hastings. Now, both of these dates are contested as a good measuring point because it's really subjective. Viking Scandinavian raiders would raid before this. They have at least one date of contact in England six years prior to this. Scandinavian raiders and warriors set out beyond this. But these are the conventional dates. Um, they are also both rooted in English history, and that is somewhat limited. However, for conventional, for the sake of convention, we're going to say that these dates matter. Having established that framework of history, I now need to make a quick disclaimer. Modern media is collaborative. 
Movies, TV shows, and video games have large teams of people working on them. And professionals working in these industries may or may not be trained in history. Additionally, those who are may not be in the room when key decisions are made on a project. It is not my intention to disparage the hard work of those who work on these projects, nor is it my intention to say that these are inherently bad or that fans who like them are in some way at fault. Rather, I'm just trying to correct some of the historical inaccuracies and problematic tropes I continue to see in the nature of these stories about Vikings. With all due respect to the hard work of the creative teams and to the people who enjoy these stories, I still intend to carve these things up like a berserker on the warpath. So interestingly enough, I'm actually wearing a t-shirt with the epic poem Beowulf written, and I'm sure you cannot read that teeny font. Beowulf is one of the oldest works of English literature, and I actually have the book right here. It begins, and this is what English used to sound like, Hwed, where Gardena. I'm not formally trained, so those Anglo-Saxon scholars out there, I'm sorry about my pronunciation, but the beginning, the first word, Hwet, hark, listen. Yeah, that began the epic poem, listen y'all, hark and hear, Hwet, Gardena, Spear Danes. In the first major epic poem from the English language that has survived, Beowulf, they're talking about Danes coming with spears. Now, I want to talk about the England problem for a moment, because there is a real problem with story after story after story showing the Vikings hitting England. And, you know, I'm speaking English. There, there's a good reason to value the role of the English in history. Um, but I'm tired of this story. Okay, we measure the Viking Age as beginning in 793 with the attack on the English monastery of Lindisfarne. We measure the Viking Age as ending in the year 1066, five days before the Battle of Hastings. You know what? The story's been told. There are some great sources of the Viking invasion of England, the Dane Law, some fantastic characters worth following, and they've been done to death. They have had their time feasting in Valhalla, and they have earned their fame. This story trope of Vikings in England just needs to go out like an adventurer who took an arrow to the knee. I used to be an adventurer like you, and I took an arrow in the knee. Despite these explorers traveling all over the world, we keep getting all these stories set in the same teeny island. So yeah, I'd like to see them in other places. I'd like to see Vikings in Baghdad. I'd like to see Vikings up among the Sami of the north. I'd like to see them... Uh, there's a great source, it's actually an English source, but I'd like to see uh, Uttar, or Uttar um, the far-traveled sailing around the top of uh, Norway down into the White Sea in Russia. I'd love to see the Viking settlement of Canada or North Africa more. Um, of Spain, the Siege of Paris, the fights against Charlemagne. These are stories that would be awesome. Show me the Vikings in Bulgaria against the Byzantine Empire. Because we deserve better stories, frankly. We get the same lazy stories, and I think it is laziness. The writers for these series have practically the entire world to work with. The Vikings got to four different continents, and yet all of these stories keep taking place in England. If the Vikings had been that timid, there wouldn't be the Viking Age. That said, I want to address something that is an even bigger point of controversy. And I don't mean the controversy of me shaving my beard in the middle of shooting this video. In her book, Women in the Viking Age, the historian Judith Jesch begins with the following quote. Vikings are irredeemably male in the popular imagination. Fierce bands of bearded and helmeted warriors emerge suddenly and inexplicably from the countries of the far north, descending on the peace-loving and vulnerable inhabitants of Christian Europe and their fast ships. They maim and murder, rob, pillage, and destroy and enslave, venting their fury on defenseless monks, and women in particular. That, at any rate, is the historical myth. So we get two types of women, really that uh, we see in most adaptations of Viking stories. One is the housewife or maiden, basically the passive woman who is uh, 
she's there as a love interest for a victim. And the other type is the warrior woman or the shield maiden. To be clear, we have examples of both types of character in real life from the sagas and other medieval documents, but unfortunately these seem to be the only types of portrayals of women from the time period in most modern stories. So women in the Viking Age were treated better than almost anywhere else in medieval Europe. There are definitely some other exceptions, I don't want to generalize, but we need to be careful about projecting our modern sensibilities back into time. Can she not hold her tongue for just one moment? No! She cannot! And she will not! Scandinavian cultures at the time were a very gendered society, but not in the sort of patriarchal way that you have elsewhere. Women had agency. Uh, a wife could divorce her husband. She was generally considered to be in charge of the finances of the home. And many women um, operated uh, what we would call factories, I guess, where uh, several women would work looms to produce uh, the sailcloth, and this was one of the most lucrative businesses at the time. You also have this uh, many examples where um, women are involved in politicking. The men might be the face of it out in uh, public gatherings, but women would send men off to do their bidding, to seek vengeance or um, for a slight against a family, and they would be directly involved in the household in these ways, of uh, contributing to family honor. What in the name of Loki do you think you're doing? Women also, not just in archaeological sources or written sources, but both, we have examples of shield maidens, of uh, women who fought alongside men. And there are a few major examples of um, battles where women were significant players who helped turn the tide. So one of my favorite sections about the Viking occupation of England is basically the English as a bunch of medieval incels. And in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, they have a section where they basically say, yeah, the Vikings take baths. They're these blonde, pretty boys who treat women right and they bathe. We have to kill them. They're taking our women. And there was absolutely some um, stealing of women and some very uncomfortable treatment in the Viking Age. But uh, this is the English going, we could treat our women better, but we'll just kill these guys instead. What in the name of Loki do you think you're doing? Frankly, me about Vikings just, it sells women short. I am all for seeing strong women as these great shield maidens in battle. But more than that, I keep seeing them as these passive maidens and housewives, as victims. And I would like to see women with more agency. The sagas definitely focus more on men, as do most of the medieval accounts by uh, Christian and Muslim writers at the time. But we know that women were revered. We know that they were part of religious rituals. We know that they were in positions of honor. I also want to briefly touch on one of the most important occupations of the time period, both religiously and culturally, and that is a woman who is called the vulva. Now, a vulva, V-O-L-V-A, was a, a seeress and a magic woman who would be a healer and a spiritual advisor. Uh, the sources we have would indicate that she would travel between communities, probably. She would carry a large staff as a part of her ceremonial regalia and she would enter into these ecstatic trances, uh, doing sort of shamanistic journey work, which anyone interested in Viking Age magical and religious traditions, this is really cool stuff. Now, getting beyond that, um, the vulva would also, we have a burial mound of one, so we know that they were honored in these very important burial traditions. Um, in uh, Kalpang in Norway, modern day Larvik, we have uh, a vulva burial mound. Originally, I had a much longer section here regarding women in the Viking Age, much of which got into a lot of the sources about Viking shield maidens. But the truth is, trying to summarize all of that concisely here would defeat my point. In all times, women are complex, and unfortunately, usually underrepresented. This is true of the historical sources we have. I could go on about the importance of writing women well, but it should be obvious. And while it's unfortunate that we only really get two tropes for the most part, at least these tropes have some basis in the sagas and documents we have, even if it's an oversimplified version usually. But 
the costumes Vikings wear in TV shows and movies, that's not even rooted remotely in history. Can't walk around with horns on her helmet. It looks ridiculous. Fashion is about taking chances, daring to be bold. Now, the big thing I really want to get into as a starting point is the way Vikings are dressed in a lot of this. They're dressed in furs and leather armor. And that's just, it's lazy, it's kind of stupid, and it sells them short. The idea is that Vikings killed animals. They were manly men who wore the pelts of leather of the things they killed and hunted. They didn't need textiles. And one, that's just not accurate. It's kind of silly. And anyone who knows the first thing about history knows it's wrong. But secondly, there are really beautiful pieces of textile from the Viking Age. We have surviving bits of cloth that have been preserved in burial mounds in clay that will just steal your breath away. We have cloth of gold. Um, we knew that Vikings traded for different types of like rare silks from the East and we're proud to wear these. Normally they would wear a lot of linen and their armor was metal. Now, not many people could afford armor, but they weren't wearing animal skins and pelts. They weren't wearing these like Ren Faire leather armor pieces that, you know, lots of people have done videos on this, but it's just not rooted in history. Maybe it saves the costuming department's money in some of these TV shows and movies, but it's not showing real people. Now, the one thing that some people have suggested is there's the concept of the Viking Berserker, uh, the Berserk bear shirt, which could either be bear chested or literally bear the animal shirt. And we don't know which linguistically, it could go either way. And there are a few variants of the Berserker. For example, um, another group, in addition to the Berserker, there was the Uthheden or Uthhednars, plural, were um, wolf warriors who supposedly, rather than taking sort of this uh, mystical importance of the bear, would wear wolf pelts and would have this sort of Odinic uh, connection, it's believed, to wolves. Some of the sources, like uh, Volsunga Saga, the Saga of the Volsungs, has an account where um, father and son take wolf pelts, put them on, and are able to change form into wolves, but become increasingly aggressive and start snapping at each other. So they can switch between the human skin and the wolf skin, but the wolf-like qualities remain with them afterward. So you have these ideas of these um, fur-clad, shape-shifting warriors who um, were full of rage, full of just, they were unstoppable force. And the full truth about berserkers is worth its own video. However, well, you might've had this elite group of uh, berserkers who would occasionally possibly we don't know, but some people argue war animal pelts. That would have been the exception. Most Vikings would have had linen, uh, wool, and uh, if they were rich, they could have chainmail armor, a metal helm. Um, and that was really what they wore for the most part. And of course, most important of all, they never wore horns on their helmets. So this video is actually days in the making, and as I'm recording this clip, you've probably seen my facial hair and t-shirts change a bunch. I actually haven't even launched the YouTube channel as I'm filming this. But if you're liking what I've been doing here, hit like, hit subscribe, share this with your friends. And this next section I'm actually really proud of, but it shouldn't cause any controversy, right? Because we're talking about religion. The novelist Daniel Jose Older has an essay uh, currently up at BuzzFeed that I'll try to link to down in the doobly doo below. And in it, he describes what you do when you are writing the other, someone with different experiences in yourself. And what he gets into is writing different races, different genders, different sexualities, and different religions. And he talks about the fact that often indigenous religions are othered. They're shown in this mysterious, highly dramatic way that most of the people writing them would not describe their own religious traditions this way. People still honor and uh, venerate, worship the Norse gods, the Teutonic gods. I'm among them. And not all of the traditions have been preserved but we should really work to try and do what we can to respectfully 
show other religions in any media. Now, I know the usual tradition on YouTube is just to insult and bash everything I see as wrong, but I actually want to take a moment to praise two works that I think did something pretty well. Both the TV show Vikings and the film The 13th Warrior drew directly upon historical sources and really went the extra nautical mile, so to speak. They mainly took from the writings of the Muslim travel writer Ibn Fadlan, who witnessed a Viking funeral and the surrounding rituals. Additionally, the show Vikings takes from the writings of Saxo Grammaticus in their portrayal of the temple at Uppsala in Sweden, which was one of the most important and sacred sites to Viking Age heathenry. Neither of these is a perfect representation of the Viking Age religious traditions, but they are handled with far more respect than most media, as we usually just get someone talking about honor, invoking the names of the gods, and then screaming about Valhalla. Well, it's time for the Atis tube. Anyone want to go first? It's a matter of honor, isn't it? Oh yeah, the Atis tube is probably the most honorable thing you can do. Honor is really important, Bill. Yes. Now, to Valhalla! Part of the narrative we also have is that these uh, pagan Vikings who worshipped these old gods were Christianized. And in Western Europe, that was eventually true. And sometimes they did it by choice, and often they were forced to. In fact, um, Charlemagne may have helped start the Viking Age because he pressed a genocidal war against the neighboring Saxon people who shared the religion of the Vikings right up to their territory. But there's also increasing evidence to suggest, and I, we don't know definitively either way, but there might have been a number of them who converted to Islam. We have a lot of archaeological evidence that suggests this is a real possibility. And we know that goods from the Muslim world were incredibly valued. However, while we know that the Vikings and the Muslim world had regular contact, and that the Vikings valued the goods they traded with the Abbasid Caliphate and the other Muslim cultures they encountered, that is not the same as having proof of conversion. What articles on the topic of the Vikings converting to Islam I've read have taken known data and extrapolated upon it to guess what could have happened, but not a single one has made a scholarly point showing that it did happen. Most stories in the Viking Age also get into religion because Christianization did end the Viking Age while it began with a mostly non-Christian people who worshipped gods like Odin and Thor and uh, Freya, encountering people who had been Christianized or were in the process of being Christianized. But we have to be careful when we're showing another religion because people today still do worship and honor the Norse deities. And I think we need to be aware of that. One nice thing about movies and TV shows is that they do a great job of humanizing the past and bringing it to life. But it shouldn't be a surprise that people are always people. What a lot of these fail to do is to actually show the real value system. So I'm just going to explain what it is and not try to compare it to anything else. You'll see the word honor thrown around a lot. I'll talk a little bit about honor here. But this is just a little bit of what the Viking Age value system would have looked like. The most important concept I want to introduce here to understanding Viking worldviews and morality is something called Hamingya. Hamingya can best be translated as luck, but it is also connected to our understanding of karma. Let's pretend you're a Viking in the Viking Age. You're pillaging, enjoying the screams of your enemies, you know, doing honest work. Your deeds determine your fortunes. And similarly, the deeds of your family and your ancestors also determine these fortunes. This is called Hamingya. I don't want to go too broad on this concept, but the idea that your deeds directly affect your worth and what comes to you in life is very important. But it's also important to understand that you as, are not an individual as a Viking, as well, not just a Viking, but anyone in this time period. You are part of a clan and a family, and that the worth, the luck, the fortunes of a clan, the deeds of a family are connected to everyone within that unit. The other concept that is most commonly associated with Viking Age morality is the idea of honor. Now, honor is different for every time period and every culture. So when we're talking about honor in the Viking Age, what is it? Well, I'm going to give some examples of some activities that would be considered honorable. 
showing bravery and accomplishment in battle, avenging a slain family member, accumulating a lot of wealth, and maintaining an oath. In fact, oath breaking was considered one of the gravest sins, a concept which is alien to a lot of us today and which I wish was alien to more of us, is that one's worth was tied to one's wealth in the views of society. By extension, if one committed a crime, one would quite literally be made to pay, either in silver or blood. Now, let's imagine again that you're a Viking. You're drinking mead by the hornful. Let's say you're well off, so you've got a helmet that absolutely does not have horns and someone from another family or clan kills one of your family members. Okay, there are a couple of options. You can seek vengeance. You can go out and kill the person who killed your family member, or you can kill one of their family members. These major feuds were a huge part of the sagas, and because they're all connected in this large family network, then to kill one of their family members is just as valid an act of vengeance as killing that person. However, the other option is that person can offer you money, wergeld, the price of a life. One thing I want to touch on really quickly right here is that I've seen a number of writings that try to equate the Germanic concept of clan and family, which were important in the Viking Age, to the modern conception of race, often trying to stretch the definitions of linguistics to arrive at this point. Please be aware, race is a modern construction that did not exist during the Viking Age. While I'll touch more on that topic later, the idea of Vikings having any idea of racial purity is actually pretty hilarious. These guys took the best from every culture they encountered. They encountered lots of other cultures, other tribes, other ethnic groups, other religions, and any time they could benefit from trade or from learning some new skill, they loved it. They took full advantage of it. We have all these writings of how excited they got. I mentioned the poem The Hafamal earlier, and that's maybe the best example of Viking Age wisdom and values. But one of the big things that the poem focuses on is practicality. It's doing what's smart but also not being a smart aleck about it. Um, I'll give an example of this. Some Vikings ran away from battle. And by some, I mean we have plenty of examples of it. Not all of them died with a sword in their hand. I gave this section the title Viking Virtues, but really it's a pretty broad, brief generalization of a large swath of Old Norse values. Beyond that though, not everyone was a warrior, but those who went a Viking they lived and they often died by sea and by steel. I love a good sword fight or shield wall fight, something just a good fight scene is well done. It gets the blood flowing, both, you know, internally for me as a viewer and the screen painted red with blood eagles of gore. Um, I see it kind of lazily done a lot in action scenes and fighting stuff but it doesn't have to be. There are some cool techniques and weapons and fighting styles that I would love to see done right. Um, that is the one thing I see done the best. Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the Vikings TV show, they seem to put the effort in to try and have some accuracy, even older stories. Um, they're definitely one of my favorite somewhat dated and somewhat problematic movies is The 13th Warrior, in which uh, Antonio Banderas plays the Muslim chronicler Ibn Fadlan, sailing off with a group of Vikings to fight Neanderthals, but um, with Beowulf. I love that because it gets into the attitudes in many ways of Vikings. It captures them. There's a, a line I love where Ibn Fadlan, the, the character played by uh, Antonio Banderas, kills someone. He's like, breathing hard, and one of the Vikings looks at him and goes, Don't worry, little brother. There's more. It's all right, little brother. There are more. I love that. It's over the top. It's, don't worry. There's more people for us to kill and gloriously die fighting. You know, that attitude was real. And of course, there are other attitudes. You read the Icelandic sagas and you get people who are cowards running away. Um, there's a guy in Njal's saga who uh, he's about to join someone else on a 
well, basically on a vengeance spree. And his wife goes, hey, I don't think my husband's really up to it. He's going to shame our whole household. Let me know when he fails. And yet, doesn't shame it. Him and the brave generic warrior fight side by side. Reading an Icelandic saga is like watching a B-action summer blockbuster movie with these over-the-top fight scenes, and I love it. You know, you get like uh, scenes where like someone will throw their shield down on a frozen river and like ride it like skates and like behead someone as he passes by on the ice. It's great. Um, that is the sort of thing that I would like to see done that they're trying to do, but we can push it up. We have so many written sources and some of the written sources were written hundreds of years later and describe equipment that was never used. You get a lot of stuff where like the Vikings have straps on their shields in these sources. Vikings never had straps on their shields. Uh, they had like a metal buckler in the center that would have a handle on the far side and they would hold it at an angle and I'm being super technical, but like that is stuff that's fun. Okay, so I'm not gonna try and describe the entirety of Viking combat here. I also realize there are entire YouTube channels dedicated just to that concept. I'll say this, the Vikings were a warrior culture. They were also an oral culture, which is a lot less fun than the bathing English Vikings would have you believe, depending on what you ask the English women. You belong to me now, old man. But basically, Vikings in the Viking Age told stories and recorded things as an oral history. It was written down much later, and a lot of what was written down, as I've said, was wrong because things get lost over the years. One thing movies and TV have gotten excellent at is making a good fight scene. This is their bread and butter. How historically accurate it is or not really doesn't matter here up to a point. Now, some of them are about as accurate as George Washington riding a dinosaur into battle against Decepticons, and that's where I take issue. I'm going to give two examples of critiques. There's worse out there, there's better out there. So the first critique, The Last Kingdom, the TV show. I love Bernard Cornwell's novels. I'm not quite caught up, but you know what? I have tried watching that TV show I don't know how many times. And I just, I can't. And one of the big reasons why is just how inaccurate so many of the details are, in particular in the fights. And that big opening battle is a great example where just the shields are wrong, the tactics are wrong, the tactics are different from the book, and I get nitpicky about that, it takes me out of the moment. The other thing is the Assassin's Creed Valhalla video game. Now, it's not out. I, as I'm making this, it is months away, but you know what? The original Assassin's Creed game was inspired by the historical assassins, the Hasashim, who were an Ismaili Muslim group during the Crusades, who were, well, assassins who worked under someone called the Old Man of the Mountain. It was also inspired by the novel by Vladimir Bartol, Alamut, which got into some pretty cool philosophical point. You know what's not cool? Seeing Vikings using those skinny little assassin blades. They have no place in the Viking Age. They're a weapon of a very specific culture from a very specific time and place. But then again, you know what's also not cool? I've gone this entire time talking about Viking combat without telling you anything about Viking combat. So just real quick, the most bare bones stuff. There were really five types of uh, weapons you see the most of. The long sword, a short sword called a sax, the ax, the spear, and the round shield, which was itself a weapon as well as a defensive tool depending on you know how it was used. There were also really four types of combat you're going to see the most of. Raids, which don't often come into movies and TV shows. Large pitched battles, which is where you're going to see the shield wall the most. Um, personal vendettas between families, which take a lot of forms. And then you're going to see a type of duel called Holmgang, which is one-on-one -on -one combat. Holmgang! So those are really the things that it comes down to. And then everything else, the particular techniques, um, you know, how weapons were used together, these are where a lot of the debates and subjectivity come in. Of course, this isn't just a video about historical Vikings. I'm talking about how the media portray them and how we as modern audiences receive them. 
this next section is, I think, the most important and also the hardest part of this entire video. Now, one thing we should talk about, no narrative exists in a vacuum. Every story exists in the context in which we tell it. And that's just the nature of life, storytelling. But when we discuss history, we aren't just discussing the actual events, the history, but the historiography, the narrative of how we tell this story. And we live in a world where since the 19th century, nationalist interpretations of history have used Vikings to try and justify racist understandings of history. Race, racism. These are new ideas. They did not exist in the Viking Age. To quote the historian Ibram X. Kendi in his book, Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. All in all, ethnic and religious and color prejudices existed in the ancient world. Constructions of races, white Europe, black Africa, for instance, did not, and therefore racist ideas did not. Creators who tell stories that are set in the Viking Age need to be aware of how these stories will be perceived by modern audiences. Nazism and other racist ideologies exist by devaluing human life and valuing genocide. They cannot be compromised with, and it is a responsibility of all creators to make sure that racists feel unwelcome. Now that I've dealt with that necessary but unpleasant topic, I want to bring up something which is frankly almost unheard of on the internet, the pursuit of nuance. I think people keep making stories in the Viking Age because they see Vikings as warriors. And they were warriors. That was their career. They went off raiding and fighting and exploring and trading. And they don't want the exploring or trading parts because that's just not as interesting in a story often as seeing these guys with their blonde hair and their rippling thews, you know, muscle-bound hunks running along the sword, chopping into people with their swords and screaming in a berserker rage while chewing on their round shield. Hey, it's fun. It's good TV. Except it's not. It's a great premise if you give it a little bit more nuance. I would love to see stories that got into Viking poetry or trade or how they navigated the stars and coastlines. The TV show Vikings does a really good job at some parts of showing how Vikings built ships and how they navigated. It does other things less well, but props. There's a scene in the first season where they actually cite a primary source uh, word for word, and that shows a level of commitment to research. The source they choose uses a word that would have been unknown to the Viking vocabulary because it was an outsider looking in, but I appreciate that level of commitment. You know what? Vikings loved cats, or at least they spread cats around, right? I want to see a so story about a Viking warrior and his cat. I'm a writer. I like good stories. I think that sometimes the purpose of history is to grapple with answers that you can never know. And the purpose of storytelling is to compromise and make certain changes for the sake of a dramatic narrative. And I fully own that. I want nuance. I don't see a lot of nuance. I see a lot of shrieking berserker stereotypes. <laughs> At the end of the day, I just want good stories. I want stories that treat this time period I love with the same attention to detail that I think it deserves. And I think it would make the entire experience better for people. This is Njal's saga. It is the longest of the Icelandic sagas. It is full of banter, and some great one-liners and amazing sword fights and battle scenes and legal dramas, which, okay, 
legal dramas set in the Middle Ages are pretty dry, but you know what? I would rather reread Niall's saga almost any time, or almost any of the sagas, than watch most of the supposedly newer, more engaging media I'm seeing. Not just because it's more accurate, but because there's just more going on. I really think this is a time period that you could do almost anything in. When you have a culture of explorers who went everywhere, they went to the Middle East and to the Americas, to North Africa and Paris, throughout Eastern Europe and Western. I'd like to see that level of commitment. And I get their budgetary restraints and that it takes a lot of work to do a lot of research. But you know what? If you're gonna tell a story, you might as well tell a good one. Hey, thank you for watching and for getting this far. This is the first video I've recorded of all of these and it has been a huge learning experience. Um, I do not have a big technical background. I tend to be about on par with Vikings when it comes to technology. But if you liked it, hit like, hit subscribe, all that. If there's something you want more of in this, let me know. If you have questions or things that I got wrong, engage with me, tell me, hey, you got this wrong, or tell me what you want to see more of and I'm happy to do it in the future. Also, particular thanks to Ryan Rigpath, Josh Hollinsworth, and James Blake, without whom this video would not exist. Uh, to everyone else who came and watched, thank you so much for giving me your time. Bye, until next time.